This episode of Hack 5 is brought to you by Domain.com. Hello and welcome to Hack 5. Ich heiße Darren Kitchen. It's your weekly dose of Technolust and I am here in Berlin at Tempelhof Field. This is so exciting. We are at a kind of epic airport right now and this is actually well, this is one of the oldest international airports up until 2008 when it was closed and turned into a park. It's also very pivotal in the uh, in the Berlin blockade as part of the you know Berlin airlift. So as far as like aviation history is concerned, kind of pivotal, kind of epic. And I will leave links in the show notes to some interesting reading on that front because it's really cool Cold War era good stuff. Um, but I am actually here to fly. I've got my uh, flight bag ready and I thought I'd talk about some of the upgrades and some of the follow-ups since uh, the other week. So, most notably, I got a bunch of comments on this and let me just go ahead and break out some of this gear. Uh, most notably, yes, so you should be mindful of all of the different regulations when you go to fly in different countries and so that's kind of one of the things I'll be talking about. First of all, RTT and E uh, has kind of a pretty strict regulations when it comes to 5.8 gigahertz transmitters. So that's why I'm actually using a 25 milliwatt while I'm here in Europe, um, whereas normally I can use something like a 600 milliwatt in the United States and that's always good stuff. But, uh, you know, be respectful, understand that. And honestly, in an open field like this, I think 25 milliwatts is going to be uh, just fine. And I've also made some pretty significant uh, improvements here to the i1 Extreme. So as we talked about the other week, this is the carbon fiber folding mod on the i1 Extreme using the Phoenix Flight Gear. Good stuff here. And the biggest change uh, is actually this PPM receiver. This is one of the really cool things in the RC world is there's so much community development. This is actually one of those where uh, some guys have come, uh, you know, put together a, uh, a receiver because they just weren't happy with what was on the market. And uh, under this uh, heat shrink here is a really awesome board that does receiving under one servo cable. So typically what you'll have is You'll have a different receiver, you'll have a different servo cable for all of the different avionics. So your ailerons, your, thru, uh, your, your throttle, uh, your elevators, your rudder, all of those will have a different cable. Uh, or at least that is typically the standard with some of the Spectrum gear uh, that I'm used to at least. Uh, what's really cool about this PPM and kind of goes in with what we were talking about the other week with PWM is that it multiplexes all of those channels onto this one chip. And it's so cool that the guys that built the i1 Extreme uh, had that foresight because what it means is when I plug this in, this speaks the Spectrum protocol and that means that I can bind it with a different uh, remote. You'll remember the biggest complaint that I've been having thus far with this is really just the range. And part of that is due to the mod. See, carbon fiber has this tendency to soak up radio frequencies. And as this board here with the receiver built in for the little PlayStation-like remote that I showed you, um, it tends to block that. And I was getting something like anywhere between maybe 300 and 500 feet range, which really isn't great. And also um, that's a huge wiggle room. I mean, we're talking almost 50% like difference there. And so it was very uh, unnerving to fly because you never know when you were going to lose signal. And when you do, what would happen is it would just uh, fall out of the sky, which is just not cool. Uh, so this solves that by speaking spectrum and allowing me to bind it with a real transmitter, you know, real, uh, and that's, uh, I'll get to that in just a second, but I'm very happy with this because it moves the PPM receiver off of, you know, the main PC board here and also this a uh, unit right here is actually, this is a very shortened cable, but essentially on the back here, Velcroed, is a satellite receiver. So what I end up with is actually, you know, I've got uh, this antenna here plus two more. Um, and the satellite receiver, basically, it's going to choose the better of the signals between all of these. And that's really nice because I can also point them in different directions. So as we've talked about with radios and polarization before, if my uh, antenna transmitter is vertically polarized, right, and then I've got a vertically polarized antenna on the craft, well, that's great until I go into a turn like this, and now suddenly this horizontally polarized. So by having, uh, you know, a 90 degree difference between these two antennas, I'll always have a good signal. That's really nice. Um, now, in order to speak with this over, you know, over that uh, transmitter, um, over the PPM, 
I've gone ahead and changed out for a slightly larger transmitter, but I must say this is just about the coolest thing. So this is a modded uh, Devention Devo 7E transmitter. And what's really cool about the 7E, and actually most of the uh, Devo controllers here is, well, first of all, it's pretty small considering this is a full featured six channel transmitter, um, but mostly it's very moddable and there's open source firmware available, which is, just rad. Uh, so this is running the deviation firmware and it's so cool. It's so easy to program. Essentially, you've got a USB port here and when you plug this into your computer while holding down the ENT button, it'll actually mount as a FAT32 file system. It's only two megs, but most of the configuration is just done with text files anyway. I have to give mad props over to Massive RC for going ahead and actually creating a configuration already for the i1 Extreme. So really, aside from just binding this to the Lemon RX uh, over the PPM, uh, there wasn't really much to do, or I'm sorry, over the Spectrum. So, that's really cool. I mean, it, it increased my all all up weight just a little bit, but otherwise, uh, you know, it's worth it because what I've done here is I'm, I'm getting something like, you know, 10 times the range that I was receiving before. And I've done a little bit to kind of keep it compact, like I've removed the antenna mast and just folded the antenna over to the inside. Shouldn't impact it too much. Um, and yeah, overall, very happy with this. You know, you get a nice display there and you can actually go into the menus and change all of your different values to just the way you like it. So I'm going to go ahead and leave that there. And then the other piece of equipment that that I've uh, that I'll be rocking on the trip and this is one of these. Hang on. This is a uh, first world problem here. I can't wear the Google Glass and the uh, Fat Shark goggles at the same time. The Fat Sharks are kind of your I guess you would say industry standard within FPV or first person view flying. Um, and they're pretty good. I just got the, the newer ones from these. Uh, these are the, uh, the Fat Shark Dominator V2s. The Dominator HDs just came out and I just got them and they're really cool. They've got a wider field of view uh, and they'll, they have uh, displays of 800 by 600 instead of 640 by 480, which I wouldn't consider HD, but it is a nice uh, bump up in quality. However, it does require a lot more power and for that reason, I'm just sticking with this one for the, the time being. I really like the fact that it's got the DVR built in, which means I'll be able to actually record uh, on the, uh, the SD card on the goggles. Now, uh, as you'll note, the whole reason for this setup is because of the battery. The whole system is built around the battery and not just the battery, but because of the chargers. Because the chargers are USB, I don't need to bring giant LiPo battery chargers with me wherever I go. And, uh, and that's kind of awesome because nobody wants to, I mean, I'm just trying to stay super nimble and it all fits in this, this uh, tiny tactical bag here. So uh, with that, uh, I will note, and um, you know, uh, Thomas S. as well as a few others uh, commented, letting me know that uh, <laughs> that while this system is based on this uh, this quasi 2s battery, whether it's a 1s, a 2s, a 3s, a 4s, whatever, what that means are the different cells, right? Normally, cells are about 3.7 volts, so a 3s battery would be 12.6 volts, and you can kind of do the math from there. Um, but each of those cells are individually charged, and what and that's what allows uh, me to use the USB charger because USB is 5 volts, and I'm trying to charge something that's 3.7, so I've got plenty of wiggle room. But to charge the whole lot of 12.6, can't do that under 5. Um, a note about uh, traveling with batteries, I should say, is that when flying uh, uh, domestically or internationally, what you'll want to do is go ahead and uh, put electric tape on the battery terminals. Uh, the TSA doesn't like it otherwise. And also, you should probably keep in mind what they call your equivalent lithium content. And I actually put this in my bag to, to, show, uh, to show the TSA agents. They kind of got a chuckle out of this. They are classified as spare batteries whenever you bring these loose batteries. Uh, there's not a limit on how many you can bring. However, there's a limit on how much uh, ELC or equivalent lithium content you can bring. And to do the math, essentially what you're looking for is to find out in grams what this uh, ELC is. What you do is you take the milliamp hours. In this case, it's uh, 1150 milliamp hour per cell. You divide that by a thousand, right? So three, and then you multiply it by the voltage. So 
the cells are 3.7 volts. So what I end up is uh, with is uh, 4.2 watt hours, which is really small, 4.2. Uh, to put that in perspective, a uh, eight gram, which is the, the limit for a smaller battery, eight gram uh, spare battery of ELC, that's 100 watt hours, right? So uh, then you can take that 4.2 and divide it by 12.5 and you'll get your ELC, which in this case is 0 0.34 grams, well under eight. Um, so I'll have links in the show notes if you do um, travel with RC on, on how to do that. Now, going back to the fat sharks real quick, uh, I was saying that the batteries are really important in the system just because they are so small. And uh, one of the things that I didn't want to have to do was bring a regular LiPo charger. The Fat Sharks do require a 2S or higher battery, which means it's expecting somewhere around 8.4 volts. You can run it off a of 3S, that's fine as well. Now, to get around the limitation of having to bring a uh, 2S LiPo battery and a regular charger, what I've gone ahead and done here is I am using our new Pineapple Juice 1500 USB battery packs. Any battery pack would work in this instance. I just like our own because I've you know, had them manufactured to our specification. Um, one of the cool things about these is you can actually take uh, two of them in parallel and actually uh, have one be charging the other so they, they kind of bond. And what that means is it will actually allow it to charge while discharging at the same time, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, so. The reason for all of this though is I can take a USB cable and pop that into here. And I've modded this USB cable on the end here is a regular 5.5 uh, millimeter outer diameter, 2.1 millimeter inner diameter uh, DC barrel plug center positive. This is the same cable that you would find on say a Wi-Fi pineapple or most gear that you know, likes things like 12 volts. And what you'll find underneath this electric tape here and under the heat shrink is actually a, uh, a voltage booster, if you will, that basically takes the five volts that's coming out of here trading off some of that amperage to create a 12 volt signal. So if you pop a multimeter on this end, you're not gonna get five volts like you would on a normal USB. You'll actually get 12 volts, which is great because now I can plug these into the goggles. And is anybody on my frequency? Nope. And there we go. And I can actually use this to fly without having to bring uh, additional equipment. And then I can just toss this in my back pocket and, and away I go. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention as far as upgrades to this guy is that I have uh, placed two simple LEDs on it, right? I've got a red in the rear and this green LED in the front here, the way that it's positioned, the, the reason it's there in that location is because my FPV camera pod just simply Velcros onto the top here. And what that means is it's pointed down and it sees this LED a little bit. And why that's important is because typically what you want to do is you want to fly with confidence, you want to fly with information, and, and normally what you'll use is what's called an on-screen display. And what an OSD or an on-screen display will do is it'll take the video uh, feed from your camera and through your transmitter, and in between there, it will tie in with the flight controller to grab interesting information like your flight speed and your altitude and your bearing if you have GPS and all of those other things, and then display them on uh, onto the, the video signal so that when you put your goggles on, you kind of see what looks like a fighter cockpit, right? You know, sometimes you get the artificial horizon and stuff like that, and it's really cool. Um, but those cost a lot of weight and you know, the more weight you add, the less your battery time is going to be. And we need to keep our thrust to weight ratio high so that we can, you know, so that we're quite agile. And so the most pivotal thing for me uh, as a pilot is that I need to know my battery voltage, because if you run your battery dead while you're in the sky, you gonna fall out of the sky and that's never good. So the nice thing about the i1 Extreme is it has a LVC or low voltage cutoff where before the battery gets too low, it will start flashing the LEDs. So quite simply, just by putting the LED within the field of view of the camera, I can now tell when it changes from just the regular strobing to the flashing real quick that, hey, I've only got a minute of flight time left. It's time to land. Anyway, that is all of that. And with that, it's time to fly. 
It doesn't matter whether you are a Triceratops or a Velociraptor. When that killer idea hits you, you need to snag a domain name and web hosting fast. And with Domain.com's quick domain discovery system and easy checkout process, you'll have your website up and running in no time. I like Domain.com because they're affordable, they're reliable, and they're super easy to use. Plus, Domain.com's active social media presence at Domain.com on Twitter and great customer support makes it super fun place to do business. The guys over at Domain.com are huge fans of Hack5 and they want to hook you up. You can use the coupon code HAK5 at checkout and get an extra 15% off. When you think domain names, think Domain.com. We're back with super fun times with Arduinos, and today we are playing with something called a serial connection with the Arduino. We already know that we can feed the Arduino some really yummy, super fancy code from the IDE to make it do a thing, but we can also use the same USB port to feed our computer data from the Arduino itself. So this is something called a serial data transfer. This means that we will feed the computer data one bit at a time, so one after another. And each bit is read by the computer as one or a zero, so this is just like any other code that you're going to use. Eight bits, of course, equals one byte, 1024 bytes equals one kilobyte, so on and so forth until you get all the way up to the really, really big things of bytes. So when you use a serial monitor and you wanna watch something get typed out onto your screen, you'll also notice that there's two little LEDs on your Arduino when you have it plugged in. They're called RX and TX, and they're just found right on the board. They're the teeny, teeny, tiny LEDs that are found right there. Can't see them very good in the, in the uh, camera itself, but you'll see them flashing when I actually use some code. Uh, you'll also want to know about this little button right here. So this is basically like a reset button anytime you use the code. Now, I wanted to show you four different examples of some code on my computer, starting with this first example, which is just a very, very simple hello world. So you want to print hello world onto this thing called a serial monitor. So when I go ahead and validate and upload this onto my Arduino, it'll just take a few seconds. And once it is done, I'll go ahead and show you what this code means. So of course, we're gonna do the void setup at the beginning. You do that setup every single time. Down here on the second line, you have serial begin 9600. So this is setting up something called a serial library, which is found in the libraries of the Arduino IDE at 9600 BPS, uh, bits per second. Now you have serial print line, which is going to be the second line down here that says hello world. So this basically means that I want it to print out hello world with a line break at the end. After that, we have a very empty void loop. So the thing that you need to remember about Arduino code is you need a void setup with something in it and then a void loop with something in it. Or it can be empty if you want, but you always have to have that void loop written at the top or else it'll think that you forgot it and it'll give you an error. So if you don't want it to loop, just put void loop and then don't write anything underneath that. So once I have that set up, I can hit this little button up at the top in my IDE and it's called serial monitor. When I click on that, it's gonna print out hello world and that's the IDE, uh, the code that's coming from my Arduino. Now if I press the little button on my Arduino, which is right here, I can press it, it refreshes the code and then it prints it again. So I could do that over and over if I want, but that's kind of boring, right? So we're gonna take it a step further now. If I open up my next code, this is called serial two. This is pretty much the same thing, but this time we put it into a loop. So we have hello world, and then I decided to make it delay for a thousand milliseconds or one second. So I'm gonna go ahead and upload that to my Arduino. So now if you look at my code down here, I basically just cut and paste serial print line hello world into my loop segment. And then under that, I put delay of 1000. So very, very simple code, very easy to understand. If I hit serial monitor this time, it'll print out hello world every one second. So it keeps on doing that over and over because it's a loop. So another very easy one. Now, what if we may want to make it a little bit more complicated? Say you're either picking up something from a uh, some kind of input device that you have have on a breadboard that's connected to your Arduino or you just want it to include some math or something a little more complicated. In that case, you would want to actually set up some kind of variables. So this time we're setting up the variables up, up at the top. We have uh, three ints. Each of those 
are some kind of numbers. We have 5, 10, and 20. And then we do the same thing. We set up with 9600 bits per second, and then we print out a whole bunch of different lines. Now you'll, not you'll notice here, if I have print line and then I have print, that's going to tell you whether it's going to have a break or it's going to complete the thing on the same line. So in this case, it's going to print A equals, and then whatever A equals, so in this case it would be 5. That'll all be on the same line. After it prints out A, we'll have a line break. So we have that print line, and so on and so forth. So it's very, very easy to understand. I'll go ahead and upload this. Okay, and if we hit my serial monitor, we get our math printed out. Now if I hold down on the little button, I did want to mention this as well. This is when you would actually notice that your LEDs are blinking whenever you click on it and you refresh your code. So you'll notice that RX and TX light up just a little bit, in this case it's just TX, and then it puts out your code onto your serial monitor. So very easy again. I'll go ahead and close this one. Now let's have a little bit more fun. So before we get into some fun with this, I wanted to do something up at the top of that last code. So I had all those ints up at the top. We have 5, 10, and 20. Those are pretty small numbers, right? So let's type in something crazy high for B. We'll make B be 155,678. That sounds good, right? All right, that's high enough. So if we have something super high like that, you'll notice that the calculation is going to be incorrect whenever you actually store this on your Arduino and get it to output into your serial monitor. Now, if I run this and I open up my serial monitor, so you'll notice that B equals 606, that's incorrect. So the reason why this happens is because an int allows you to store two bytes of data or 16 bits. We need to change the values from ints to longs, which is a completely different variable in regards to Arduino code or C code. So a long type can store 32 bits of data as opposed to just 16. The Arduino has a lot less memory than your computer does, so it's really important to change your types whenever they need to, to be ordered to, to allow you to conserve as much memory as possible whenever you're actually outputting this information from your Arduino, or else your entire code is going to get screwed up. So in this case, I want to go over here and change int to long. And you'll notice long automatically changes into that orange color, so I'm going to upload this. And if I go over to my serial monitor, now it'll print out the correct amount of bits, or the actual data that B is supposed to be. Now if I pull up a website on here, it's over at the Arduino website, I'll put this in the show notes too. This explains all the different variables that you can use and how many bits you're going to have available for each kind. Now up at the top, I actually wanted to quote this because it's explains it in a very easy way. A variable is a way of naming and storing a value for later use by the program, such as data from a sensor, or an intermediate value used in a calculation, which is exactly what we just did. So the reason why you want to make sure that you're using the correct type of variable for whatever kind of math or whatever kind of um, you know, sensor that you're using is because it's going to be storing that data for later on in the code. If your code is crazy, crazy long, it could completely screw up the information that you're trying to output and give you incorrect data values. So if I scroll down a bit, there's this website down here. It says some variable types, and they have longs here. They have unsigned longs as well, floats, doubles. A lot of this is going to look familiar if you use C code before. If you haven't, definitely check out the site and read up on it because it'll explain everything that you need to know about different variables. Okay, so now that we got all that super geeky hard stuff out of the way, let's go have some fun. Okay. So I decided that since we're messing with, you know, serial monitors and whatnot, I wanted to make some ASCII art, because why not? So I just created this ASCII art that says, well, it's supposed to say hack five for the win. Isn't it cute? With a whole bunch of print lines. And then I don't want it to run over and over again, so I didn't include the print, the void loop. So when I upload this, it should just print out once. It should look really nice and tidy on my serial monitor. And hopefully it works. Serial monitor. Yeah, yay, it worked. Now if I print the button, hit the button again. There we go. That's cool. Okay, so that's fun times. 
I like that. <laughs> so knowing how to actually use a serial connection for your projects can really help debug them in the future. So example, if you ha are trying to calculate the, um, maybe the temperature in a room and you need to understand exactly what's going on on the Arduino, on the sensor, and read it out into some kind of, I don't know, maybe you're doing a project for your boss or something like that, and you need them to know what the differences are in the temperature or something, then you would want to be able to calculate that information into your serial monitor so you can output it in a way that, you know, humans understand as opposed to just the Arduino. So it's very fun, it's very easy to debug things, and it's very easy to use this in the actual Arduino IDE, so they just kind of included it for you. Yay. I liked it. It was super fun. Stay tuned, of course, because we have a lot more fun times going on over here. I hope you guys enjoyed Darren's segment as well. But first, we're going to take a quick break. Patrick Norton here coming up on Tech Thing tomorrow. We're going to get hands on with the Raspberry Pi 2. Will it work as a desktop? And Shannon's got a roundup of gaming microphones to make your Twitch streaming better. Come check it out. TechThing.com or YouTube.com slash C slash TechThing. That about wraps up this episode of Hack 5, but first off, we have our trivia question. So last week's trivia question was, what was Mario's original name? There's actually two of them, but I'm gonna give you one of them, and the answer was Jumpman. This week's trivia question is, in which decade did the first transatlantic radio broadcast occur? You can answer that over at hak5.org slash trivia for your chance to win some Hack 5 goodies. And of course, if you guys have any questions or if you just want to send us some feedback, you can do so, feedback at hack5.org. Definitely check out hackacrosseurope.com, that's H-A-C-K acrosseurope.com for all of Darren's shenanigans and everything he's getting into over there. He is having some meetups, so definitely check it out. I believe over in London and Dublin coming up. So you can go over to hackacrosseurope.com to sign up and join him on all of his awesome fun times. Hack5.org slash follow is where you can find links to all of our social networks, of course. And if you want to support us directly, hakshop.com. And with all of that, I'm Shannon Morse. I'm Barry Kitchen, And we're reminding you to trust your technolist. See you next week. <laughs>